Welcome to Pitmaster, an old Virginia smoke podcast. I'm your host, Luke Darnell. I thought National Barbecue Month would be a great time to interview one of my mentors, the great Chris Hart from IQ. Dominant in the barbecue scene for a long time and winner of the Jack Daniels World Championship, Chris has written several cookbooks and continues to be an influence on cooks all across the country. Just a great guy, extremely smart and talented and a lot of fun to talk to. Enjoy this fun talk with the legend Chris Hart. This episode is brought to you by the Barbecue League. The Barbecue League is the ultimate barbecue experience. Here's why. One small annual investment from you instantly unlocks all 70 plus tell-all recipes, enthusiast recipes, restaurant tours, and more in their unmatched library. This isn't your typical YouTube type content. World champions like Get and Basted, Shake and Bake Barbecue, Heavy Smoke Barbecue, La Pasadita Barbecue and 913 Barbecue share their full tell-all recipes. No secret is left unsaid. And a new video release is guaranteed every single week of your membership. You will also see unfiltered looks from all levels of pitmasters during their live competition coverage. And those same pitmasters are accessible through the league's upbeat online community. As soon as you sign up, you'll also have a full arsenal of some of the best discounts in barbecue from brands like Snake River Farms, Blues Hog, Big Papa Smokers, Gunter Wilhelm, and Gateway Drum Smokers, and more. The Barbecue League puts on members-only contests throughout the year, hosts live and virtual events, and offers a full-access league lounge at participating events. Listeners to the OVS Pitmaster podcast can receive $10 off of the annual $100 annual membership this month only by using code, all caps, MAYPITMASTER, all one word, M-A-Y-P-I-T-M-A-S-T-E-R on the BBQLeague.com. So sign up today and up your barbecue game. So we're here with my first mentor in barbecue, Chris Hart from IQ up in Massachusetts. How you doing, man? Hey, Luke. It's good, good to talk to you. Yeah, I remember... I remember having you in my backyard for a, uh, a competition barbecue class. I don't know how many years ago it was, maybe five years ago, six years ago? Nine, eight oh or nine. <laughs> wow. Maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe you took a couple tips away that helped, helped you out a little bit. It seems like you've been, you've been doing just okay, huh? Yeah, it's, you know, I didn't think, I didn't even know about barbecue classes at the time. My friend Mark Gibbs called me and said, hey, can you get yeah. up to Boston for this class? I can't go and I'll sell you my seat really cheap and you can go. And I was like, what are you even talking about? Like there's classes <laughs> and change the trajectory trajectory of our barbecue lives. I learned more in that one weekend than I've learned in any other class. So right on, right on. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a crazy thing. Like when, uh, like my work colleagues on, on, a, on something like that, like, what are you doing this week? And I was like, well, I'm teaching a, competition barbecue class it's kind of hard to explain to people exactly what it is you're doing and i think that a lot of times brand new people that come and take a competition barbecue class without a lot of experience they're they're shocked at the level of detailed orientation and the number of steps and the number of things that that cooks are doing to create incredible uh, competition barbecue it kind of blows their mind what goes into it i think sometimes i had no idea some of the things that you could do like to get a to finish i think finishing is probably the most underrated thing that you know everyone talks about what time do you put your meat on what time do you cook what temperature do you cook it to i think finishing is probably it's the number one thing that i learned from you in terms of the attention to detail and how you can never give up on a piece of meat there's always something that you can do to make it better absolutely absolutely yeah. I think that a lot of times at a, at a contest, especially today where there's a lot of like information in the clear, everyone's kind of in a big, lots of teams are in a very similar place around 1130. A lot of the same rubs are being used. A lot of the same pieces of meat are being used. A lot of the same techniques learned at the same barbecue classes are being used. But it's that end part where you can make really good decisions or not, or not so good decisions uh, that often makes the difference. I agree that that uh, the last 30 minutes is uh, critical. Absolutely. I remember leaving your class 
and you telling me that I was cooking that next weekend and you telling me that, you know, because I had the class, I had to beat Mark that next week. And I did. And, <laughs> and uh, I remember, I mean, one of the things we learned too from your class was repetition and practice and really getting to know your smokers and your meat. We cooked that whole winter after that class just cooking the recipes and really getting to know them and then tweaking them to fit stuff that we did. Exactly. Yeah, that's the way, that's the way to do it. That's how, that's how I learned when I first got started in, you know, probably serious about competition barbecue 2002 Mm -hmm. is about 20 years ago is when I really got, kind of got into it. That was the first year that I went to the Jack was 2002. My team had been cooking like in the late nineties, 98, 99, but the way we were cooking was showing up to a barbecue festival once, once a year and getting drunk essentially, (laughs) you know, and it's just kind of burning meat, drinking beer, having a good time. We did that from like, you know, like three or four years, late nineties, early two thousands. And then I just got kind of the bug and did what you did is yeah. I, a little differently, right? I, I, I didn't take the class. I actually started hanging out on this forum, the barbecue porch, Gary Howard. I don't even, I don't know that it's still here. Facebook has destroyed all these like little niche communities that used yeah. to exist all over the internet. They just, yeah. Facebook just wiped them all out, which is sad. Uh, but back then, uh, barbecue porch was this place that I hung out and I read it. Like I was on there all the time and I bought a a Weber Smoky Mountain, 18 inch Weber Smoky Mountain. And I cooked all like constantly, like, like it was a, it was a sickness. And so the couple got, there was all sorts of really interesting people on there that had a barbecue background, right? I was, just, I was this young guy from Boston. I didn't know shit about barbecue, right? <laughs> but I got sucked into it on that, on that uh, forum. And two of the guys that were on that forum were Bill Arnold. And I remember Bill Arnold in that forum posting that he had just gotten laid off from his manufacturing job, working on a line somewhere, and he was going to give sauce making a try. Yeah. And that was one guy on that list. And the other guy on that list was Joe Ames from uh, Fab Fame. Yeah. And he sent me a pre-production Fab mixture to try out. And so those were like a couple of my, in 2002, a couple of my early products that I was using. There's a few other guys that were using it too, but if you go today to a barbecue contest, everybody's using those products. Absolutely. And, right. Like 90 something percent of people have some variation of those two products. And it was a nice, it was a nice advantage for a while to be one of the few teams that had those two <laughs> that had those products back then. But that's how I got started <laughs> was back in like the pre social media days, reading reading the internet and like soaking up as much information as I possibly could. Yeah. And classes have really leveled the playing field in terms of people who have cooked a lot and people who haven't. It's really changed the dynamic of competition barbecue, but I think in a good way to an extent. Because everyone's doing so many things that are so similar, what do you think separates a good pit master from a great pit master? I think you touched on it a little bit is saving, you know, like saving, a, you know, a, a, something a, a, a great pit master can do is when things go off the rails, they can, they can fix it. They can yeah. solve, solve the problem, whatever it might be. Like the, the like the, a classic problem might be um, your teammates wake you up at 530 in the morning and the pork butts are tempting out at 203, right? Or something, you know, something like that. It's like, what are you going to do? <laughs> it wasn't in your, it's not on your Excel spreadsheet to have your pork butts temping out at 2.03 at 5.30 in the morning. So what are you going to do about it? And somebody, a good, a good pit master is probably, you know, another way you could call someone that's a good pit master is somebody that maybe hasn't had quite enough, enough experience yet. You know, they're, they're solid and can cook great barbecue, but maybe just following the, following the, uh, the, the Excel spreadsheet and competition barbecue or, the, you know, the, the granddad's recipe or whatever, strictly. And a great pit master doesn't have to follow anything strictly. I, I think that that's, that's one thing uh, that you see in, in a great pit master and, and has, uh, has some uh, diversity in there and they can make anything taste good over fire, right? It, it not, not just like, not a one trick pony, you know, has right. a real, real diversity to being able to, you can give pretty much any kind of protein and some wood and a great pit master is going to blow you, blow you away, whatever it may be. I think the other thing that you see in a, in a great pit master is kind of 
confidence. Like when you, maybe a little less so in competition barbecue, but in barbecuing just in general, like you're, you're thinking to yourself, how do I make this taste, how do I make this better? How do I make my pork shoulder better? Yeah. And a great pit master, what they'll start doing is removing things. A, yeah. a, a new pit master will add things more, you know, another ingredient, another injection, another something in my rack, more, 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 more. Uh, a great pit master, let's more confidence, rock solid technique. And yeah. I can just let it sit on its own a little bit. I don't need to cover it up with a million things. That's, a, that, that's what a great pit master does. Removes things, maybe a less experienced pit master adds things. You just Those brought up, a, yeah, yeah, no, that's great, and you just brought up something though that I think is is very important is confidence. I've got to cook across from you and against you a few times, and one of the things that strikes me is is that you are a very confident cook, and you're very confident in your processes and what you're doing, and I know that comes from years of experience. What are some tips that you can give to people that? help them improve their confidence. I think you gotta, you gotta cook your own food, right? Is it, is it, you, you don't, you don't want to like, you gotta cook a certain kind of food to win a competition barbecue. Right? Yeah. There's, a, there's a relatively narrow space you need to be in to win a competition barbecue. You gotta be in that space. You can't like be super <laughs> creative in terms of the end product. Right. We know right. this and right. We all know this, but but it, 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 the, the place, the way to get the, the confidence built is when you're cooking your stuff and you're not chasing something, right? I, I've chased many times. You know, I find myself cooking with some new line of, of rubs that I hear are doing well or, or you're chasing. You're not, it's not really you. Mm-hmm. And you, you got to kind of get in your space where, where it's your stuff. And it takes a while. It takes mm-hmm. a while to, to get there. And that's, I think for me, that's where the confidence, uh, you know, that's where I feel, we feel, it feels natural is when I'm using my dry rub that I made from scratch that I've used a bunch of times and I know it tastes good and, and kind of, you know, kind of following my own, my own recipes and not someone else's. That's great advice. I've been fortunate enough to take a lot of these classes and, you know, see a lot of different things in barbecue and uh, people ask me all the time, how do I keep it straight? You know, and I'm like, I still cook what I'm going to cook. It's finding those two or three little tips or tricks or something that somebody does a little bit different that can really push you, push your product up. You're not going to try and replicate somebody else's product. And I remember you saying in class, like, I'm going to show you what exact how exactly I do this, but the odds of you recreating that are very slim. <laughs> yes. yeah. Well, I mean, one reason for that is because it's a little bit different every time. It's true for everybody. Like, yeah. It's never exactly. It's true for everyone that I know that there are some superhuman competition barbecue cooks who who might do it almost exactly the same way every time. I, for me, it's uh, it just doesn't go. It doesn't does just doesn't always go well. Right. And it's that constant like checking checking it checking it and trying to get it to where it needs to be a little bit more cooking from the maybe my programs will be a little little leans on cooking from the gut as opposed to following the excel spreadsheet sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't you're also known for cooking on a lot of different stuff you know yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. you, every time i see you at a competition you have different things there and i uh, do <laughs> and and I mean I think that goes back to the confidence. But how do you transition from cooker to cooker? Is it do you have programs for each, or do is it just a a different mindset for each one? Well, I've, you know I, I've been doing it for twenty years, and it's 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 just been something that's that just keeps my interest. Is 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 I, I I find that I I need to have that like obsessive obsessiveness about it, right? That I'm obsessed. I'm thinking about it all the time. Like, how am I going to cook this? What am I going to do? What can I tweak? And always thinking about the cook. And one of the things that gets me in that space is a new cook. And like <laughs> thinking thinking about the cooker and like, how am I going to use it? Why is it going to work well? I got to try it out. Like the idea, you know, maybe I've had a cooker, the same cooker for three or four years and it's Saturday and it's like, I could, I could do a practice run. If I have a new cooker, on the other hand, now I, I, that gets me interested, and I'm, off, I'm outside cooking on the new cooker. So it's just a, it's just being a gadget 
a gadget freak and loving new toys kind of kind of thing too at the end of the day at the end of the day it's just i like new toys that's pretty much it <laughs> one of the <laughs> great things i think about uh you and your team is that you guys we've been across from you at harpoon i think three times and you guys really do a great job of mixing the competition with having fun and spending time with the family and and stuff like that do you have a lot of habits and rituals or routines or things that you do during a competition that are a part of that mix? It doesn't always work. There's been, there's been, <laughs> there's been many, many takes of like, you know, overindulgence is just the beginning. It is, you know, there's six, there's six guys on the team and there's, it's kind of a lot of alpha dogs, right? A lot of like strong opinioned guys. And it's taken a long time to kind of iron out, what everyone's role is on the team and there's been a lot of drama and, <laughs> and and all that kind of stuff i think that one thing that what that really works on the team that's a lot of fun is we always have like a competition inside the competition so there's always other small competitions going on so for, for starters is we play poker uh -huh. uh, well there's always poker i have a hard time like sitting down and sitting still at a, at a contest I have a lot of nervous energy. Like I'll say, okay, I'm going to go take a break and I'll sit down and like 90 seconds later, I'm up, I'm up again. And so poker kind of is a way that gets me to sit down and relax and kind of chill. And so we play poker. One of the things that we do is we, after every contest, everyone takes a 10 or a 20 and writes down the order. They think which the best scoring category to the worst cat scoring category, chicken, rib, brisket or whatever. And everyone throws it in and whoever's closest gets, gets the pot. Oh, wow. Um, uh, we like do that, that. every contest. Yeah, yeah, that's fun. Uh, there's like, you know, there's like a box of 12 stale donuts have been sitting in an RV all weekend. Someone, you know, the team gets together 200 bucks, you know, Chris, eat all the donuts and you get 200 bucks. Stuff like that happens all the time. It keeps it kind of lo kind of loose and fun, but it hasn't always been that way. It's been, it's been uh, many years of kind of finding a, uh, a balance that works. That's right code. For, that, that's code for um, Chris finally gets gets his way and gets to do what he wants. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun cooking with a with a team of old friends, family, really. Absolutely, and I think having one person in charge is kind of essential. You know, we tried it for a couple of contests where somebody would be in charge of one thing, and it was very quickly told to me, like, "Listen, you're in charge of everything, and you need to tell us what to do." and since then, it's actually worked a lot better. Having everyone having the role is is key on a team for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We learned that very early in our competition career. Early on, we were I don't know, maybe it was two thousand two ish kind of ballpark. We were competing for a New England Barbecue Society Team of the Year. It was the last contest of the year, and we were ahead by a bit. And we had a good chance to win New England Barbecue Society Team of the Year. It was exciting. Except um, it was like a grilling contest. And I think the two of the categories were lamb and shrimp. And somebody on the team wrote it shrimp lamb on the on the piece of paper, not lamb shrimp. And we, we turned them in in the wrong order. And we lost Team of the Year because of that. Oh, no. Um, yeah, it was... <laughs> <laughs> So it was like a strong learning experience. And after that, like my brother, Jamie, is very detailed oriented and organized. And from then on, he was like the logistics guy. He, you know, wrote down the times of the turn-ins and he did the turn-ins. And, you know, this is the organ, this is what we're doing at the contest. He was kind of the, the taskmaster of the contest. That was the beginning of learning that everyone needed a role. As opposed to it was just, just a drunk free throw <laughs> before that, I guess. <laughs> But we've learned our hard lessons many times over the years on stuff like that. Well, and that's that's a good segue to another question in terms of a lot of these podcasts and people interviews and stuff. We love to focus on the successes that everybody's had. And, you know, that's all great and everything. I like to focus on failures and to that end, specific failures at a contest where you did something that you shouldn't have done, but that that got you going in the right direction and built you up for later success. Do you have any good ones of those? I don't, I don't know if they if led to later success or the, I don't know if I have <laughs> an example that's like aligned with where you're going. I'm sure there are examples of that in, in our history. I, we, we have had a long history of dropping meat on the ground. Like for instance, one of my teammates, Dave was uh, cooking overnight and I couldn't be there. And I showed up first thing in the morning and walk over, crack open the smoker beautiful glistening pork butts 
and I slide out the, it was backwards, I think at that time, and the little spot weld on the back, little corner uh, clip on the on thing had like broken, and I kind of pulled it out, and the and the rack just kind of went just, you know, oh. to the side just a little bit, and that beautiful pork shoulder rolled off and landed, didn't just land on the grass, it landed on the on the, the steel tray that we were catching all the uh, charcoal debris, and that's that's <laughs> where that's where it was so you know it got soaked in a five gallon bucket of water it got re-rubbed it got put on back on the smoker first place pork <laughs> um so then it became the joke you know we just gotta like drop you just gotta drop the meat and it only worked once it's, it's, um, <laughs> i've heard so many stories like that though you know people dumping their chicken down into the bottom of a weber smoky mountain taking it out cleaning it up and winning and it's like sure, sure. Well, I think there's there is a lesson in there, and, and the, the lesson is the judges aren't in, in your tent. Uh, now it needs to be food safe and everything. I don't want to like dim, diminish like you got to feed safe food to the judges. So if you go off the rails too much, you just got to take your medicine. But the judges aren't in your tent, so you don't get judged on how things went. Right. You know, and you can let something like that take you in a couple different directions. Like we're totally hosed. I'm done. And mm -hmm. you're going to be done, or you can right. you can you know try to get spin it in a positive direction and tick, let's okay guys let's, let's fix the problem. Keep fighting. And, yeah, <laughs> and that kind of attitude can help. You're a big music guy, aren't you? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Do Do you listen to music when you cook? Yeah, we do. We do for sure. The we listen to a lot of like '90s music. The 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 team favorite is probably the. The Beastie Boys. We listen to a lot of Beastie Boys. The big ongoing debate on our team is which is the best Beastie Boys album. Uh, there's a there's a Check Your Head faction, and there's a Paul's Boutique faction of the team. That Paul's uh, Boutique is the right answer. Paul's that, Boutique is 100% the right answer. This yes. isn't even. How's that a <laughs> Thank conversation? You. Thank you. <laughs> if it's um, the if you had to have one album on an island by yourself for the rest of your life, for me it's Paul's Boutique. Yes, it's so dynamic, and it was a commercial it is. failure. It yes. is. It's one of the all-time <laughs> great albums. You, you don't you won't see an album like that ever again. Um, uh, that's that's one of my favorites. The our go song at eleven forty-five is "Business Time" by the uh, Flight of Concords. Business time. You, you should check it out. I'll give you a good laugh. We crank okay. up eleven forty-five. We listen to a lot of nineties music. That's about it. Yeah. No, that's man. Somebody finally answered this question correctly. <laughs> BC what, Boys. What were, some, what were some of the other answers? You, you, what was a typical answer you get to that question? Uh, a lot of people are into, you know, like heavy metal or ACDC and yeah. uh, stuff like that. We take a lot of gruff guff for our music out there because it's a touch different. I mean, you'll go from BC Boys to Notorious B.I.G. to Harry Belafonte to sure. you know, you know <laughs> i've started when uh jump in the line comes on by harry belafonte i've started taking the speaker out of the trailer and basically screaming it out to the entire contest just because i think it's funny yeah <laughs> right right one thing i learned from you in class is that you're very organized is your competition planning week is it the same every week that you compete do you like to do things at the same exact time I work really hard to be organized like i i'm naturally not at all organized. I, have, I have attention deficit disorder and it's very hard for me to stay organized but i can observing really good chefs I, i'm always in awe of them cooking clean you know yeah. they, they're keeping the, you know just being clean in their in their cook whatever that may be and i I, I try, like I work at it. I have to work really hard to, to cook clean. And my, te my, my teammates are would many, many times have seen me completely cook ridiculously messy, particularly, you know, overtired, drink too much. It's like, it, it, all, it, it, I'm just, I become unable to, to cook organized in a, in a more controlled setting, like the class with paying customers there, <laughs> you know, I, I like, and I, I made really sure to be on top of my clean cooking game, but it's hard for me to, it doesn't come naturally to me. And I do have a complete kind of, you know, week, you know, from Wednesday to noon on turning day, kind of how things should go and, and all the things that I need to accomplish. I'm not a, I'm not necessarily a slave that they need to happen at a particular time other than turning in chicken at noon. There's a lot of like, it's in my best interest if I churn chicken on Wednesday night, like I should, 
But then, yeah. then it turns into, well, you know, it's late on Wednesday night. I'd probably do a better job in the morning tomorrow. Let me go do it in the morning tomorrow. And then sometimes the next thing I know, it's, I'm doing it at the contest site. You know, that happens, that happens a lot. And I haven't really known. And, and sometimes I'll, I'll completely bang out perfect prep. My sauces are mixed. My greens are, you know, cleaned and ready to go. My parsley is cleaned and ready to go. I do every, you know, have everything perfectly, perfectly done in advance by the book. And other times it's like, I'm just not up for it. I'm working too much. I'm just going to, you know what, I'm just going to deal with it when I get on site. I mean, to get all the things I need to deal with when I get on site. It can be anywhere on that spectrum. I have not observed any correlation between doing those things in my results. In fact, if anything, I would, I would observe that in the weeks that I'm, I am completely anally getting everything perfect by the book. I might do worse than I do <laughs> a little bit more organic to it. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. See, so, I thought I had the exact wrong, I had the wrong uh, yeah. opinion because I, I came away from there and I, from your class and I said, you have no idea what you're doing from one minute to the next and you need to develop a system because I'm a mess. Yeah. I've never been organized in my whole life. Yeah. So, I became organized because of barbecue and now I can't, I can't function without a list. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I love lists. I love planning. Like what's one of the, one of the things that I miss maybe more than cooking the contest or, or as much is planning for a contest. I'd love planning for contests. I love thinking through, especially like, like one of my favorite things to do, like going to the Royal six guys from Boston going to the Royal and not just going to the Royal, but, you know, cooking the invitational, cooking the open and doing well and, and organizing everything you need to do to make that happen between prep and travel and meets and everything that goes into that. I love doing that. I love planning that out. And I miss that. That's one, definitely something I missed, um, I miss uh, doing. So a lot, definitely a lot of thought, but you know, I, I, most of that organization Luke is just just something that I've done I had done at that point in my career hundreds and hundreds of times yeah and it just so it just kind of had built up to uh, just like a band you know what I mean a band that has been on the road for 15 years and they have their set list and it just has just been it just kind of built up over the years and to a great set list it's the same it was a, it's a, it was the same thing at that point it was just hundreds of contests under my belt and that's what had developed. I honestly don't remember a lot of it. Like I could go back to the, I could go back to my uh, list, to my uh, like class guide that I handed out, but I've, I've forgotten a bunch of it. I'll, I'll have to reread some of that before I cook another contest. You're going to have to break it out. I went back and reviewed my notes from your class. Yeah. Uh, because I wanted to see how much of it I still do. Yeah. And it was shocking how much of it I still do. And, you know, and it's, but what's even more shock, shocking is how subconsciously when thing, when I'm struggling with the meat is that I go back to the first thing I learned. I go back to the basics. And then, like you said, you keep people add and add and add when they really should be subtracting and, I've I've learned over the past five years, especially switching from a backwoods to a jambo as well has caused a lot of go back to the basics and work from there. And I, I mean, it was the list was long. I was like, oh, my gosh, like how influential was that in my barbecue career? And uh, right on, right on. That's I mean, uh, right on. chicken finish is exactly the same. Exactly. <laughs> Wow. I'll have to go back and read that recipe. I don't remember exactly what I taught at that time, but right on. That's good to hear. I had a really good time teaching classes and very uh, satisfying to teach and see people coming out of that class and, and level up, level up their game, learn something, use it. Lots of texts and phone calls of people being appreciative. And, and then of course, what people love to do is come up to me after a contest and let, let, let me know you know, I came in eighth in brisket and they came in first in brisket and they'd love to come up to me and say, hey, I just want to let you know, I used your brisket recipe to feed you. <laughs> like, cool. <laughs> I love that because, I mean, we've we've been fortunate enough to teach a few classes now. And when people, I mean, when people beat me and they point at you like, hey, I got you. And you're like, you're like I don't know whether to be proud or 
you know, Kim's looking at me going, why did you do that? Why did you teach him that? You know, know. it's like, (laughs) I know, I know you're you're, like the good side of you should feel proud and, and I'm I'm happy for you, man. And then there's the evil side. of (laughs) (laughs) You mentioned gadgets and that you're a big gadget guy. What are some of the best or most worthwhile investments that you've made in competition barbecue? The one that I'm sure a lot of people touch on is is Guru. I went to a contest in Maryland in in the 2000s, and uh, Shotgun Fred and and Bob were next to me. I, it may have been their first contest. I think it may have been, been the first contest that they ever went to. And like Shotgun had some contraption set up to keep water at dishwashing temperature in three five gallon plastic buckets all weekend that he had some system that he did this with uh, <laughs> and i was just watching with all these gadgets all weekend it was really impressive i I've, I've certainly used those products i mean it's hard not to say it, it's hard not to say my jambo is the, is the best thing that that i've you know the best gadget I don't, you want a gadget i guess you can't really call a jambo pit a gadget no, um, no we'll get into we'll get into like cheaper that, things that's, that's a couple like inexpensive gadgets uh, yeah, well, that i that i like a lot is one is a uh fat separator yes i'm a big fan of the fat separator uh, you know i love i love using we all i'm sure most people listening to this probably like to use their wrap juices to to finish things or add to finishing things and uh separating out that fat is is key to that so i really like a fat separator the other thing that i've, I've used a lot is a is a EC, ISI cylinder. It's like uh, what you put, like whip, if you go to Starbucks and get some whipped cream, it's those silver canisters. Yeah. And I put, I use, I use those for injections. So put your, put your injection in there, close it up. And then, you know, you can put a, it's a siphon essentially, add some CO2 to it. And it like, it like emulsif, like a really emulsifies everything in your injection. And there's, they have an injection attachment to it. And it just, Wow. It makes fast business of it and it really it really penetrates penetrates the meat. It's probably under a hundred bucks, sixty bucks or something. And it's a it's a nice uh a nice gadget I've used over the years. A couple that jumped to my mind. And you also I think you introduced me to the thumb spice grinders. Did oh, yeah. you use this? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Spice grinders are, are definitely uh key for sure. I, can't, I knew that was one of them and I wrote it down and I can't tell you how many of those we've sold over the years when people see me in class and they're like, what is that? I'm like, I'm being chefy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been, yeah. I've been a big fan of uh, fresh, fresh uh, hitting up the, the finishing rubs and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, cause it really does. If you taste them between doing that and not doing that, there really is a big difference. There is. Uh, yeah. There is. For sure. And I, I think you're entirely right in terms of, you know, when we talk about most worthwhile investments is finding a cooker that not only are you comfortable with, but that you enjoy cooking on. I think that's such a big thing, regardless of results and, or what other people are using. I cooked on Backwoods for, for several years and made the decision to switch, switch to the Jambo. And it really just invigorated me in terms of doing something new, you know, and Totally. And and now I can't imagine cooking barbecue on anything else, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, I love my Jambo for sure. Uh, that, I, it's a, uh, while I've bought and sold more pits and smokers than I can count, I will never, never let my Jambo go. That's a fam- family heirloom that will never leave my, my, uh, my possession. Uh, hand, I'm going to hand that on to my kids. I don't know if they're going to want it, but that's not going anywhere. I, I love that pit. Absolutely. When you first got started in competing, what were some of the best decisions that you made? You know, I think I think some of the some of the decisions that I I made early on in my in my career were I didn't really you know I was just a like a, a hot shot competition cook from New England. I didn't have any any culture, any barbecue culture really at all at that point in my career, and I really I kind of I kind of embraced it not not consciously but i got like really into for instance the foods like food science you know like uh, all the in the in early 2000s there was a lot of like that crazy molecular gastronomy kind of trend was going on i kind of got into that and i started thinking about how to how to how to add that to to my barbecue how i barbecue like one of the things that i did is i started using meat glue 
I, I'm fairly certain at the time, I, I was the only one going out to a field in 2004 and using meat, meat glue on my chicken. Maybe not. All those kind, like that kind of, uh, the kind of science, the food science side is something I got really into. And there was other people and, and using things like a backwood smoker. In New England, when I first started competing, it was very old school. Like everybody had like a close pit or a, like an Oklahoma Joe like those kind of pits, it was very, it was very old school. And even though there wasn't a lot of history, the guy, you know, the guys that there were like, uh, the guys that competed in competition barbecue in New England when I first started, typically, you know, used to live in Kansas City or used to live in Texas and got moved up to New England for whatever reason and had this, you know, this big, this big barbecue pit. They put their meats on at six o'clock and let it slowly cook all night. And it was just a different style than you see today, for sure. And there was a, like, uh, there was a couple of guys that influenced me, like maybe Gary Howard turned me on to, uh, to backwood smokers, but I, I kind of, I, I kind of started veering. I didn't have any interest in that. I yeah. veered towards like, how can I win the contest and, and really thinking about it as a competition and backwood smoker with a guru on it with injections and an excel spreadsheet and kind of some sci science to it is the direction i veered in and it wasn't necessarily conscious it wasn't one of those things where i said oh i need to make a decision it just kind of the way it went and that's what felt natural for me and it, it kind of it kind of worked out yeah absolutely and gosh you think about just meat glue alone i mean <laughs> How many people have used that? And, you know, I always keep a, I keep an envelope of it in the trailer at all times because you never know when something might, you know, you open up a brisket or something and you got a rip right in the middle of where you want to turn in from, you can fix it. You can. Um, yeah. yeah you can. There's, you can. Never give up. Never give up. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. Definitely not. Yeah. So that science angle on it's always been fun for me. Yeah. Who has impacted your life the most in competition barbecue? There's a lot of there's a lot of people who have I'll I'll throw out a couple people that that everyone will know maybe to start is I'd say one would be Rod Gray. Is yeah. it that that was that was the first class that I took. I took I took Rod I in the spring of 2009 I took delivery on my Jambo and I took Rod's class. It is actually Rod and Johnny. Johnny Trey. Oh wow. I took Rod I I got a Jambo I took Rod and Johnny's class. And Rod is one of those guys that I maybe was was refer mentioned, you know, thinking of when I said somebody that cooks clean, like he's or now he's organized. Like I'm not or I'm not organized. Like he is very, very organized. And he taught me he taught me how to get more organized, how to be how to cook cleaner, a little bit more thoughtfully, a little less kind of winging it. I learned a lot from him on the competition side. I think just on the barbecue side, another name would be Mike Mills. And I, oh, yeah. I think with Mike Mills, what he, what I learned from Mike Mills was the culture of barbecue, like getting you know, kind of like moving on from just being the hotshot competition cook from New England and learning more about, you know, uh, the history of barbecue, the culture of barbecue, barbecue and family, all, you know, that, that kind of side of it. Um, I learned a lot from Mike, who's really influential, really influential in, 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 um, being able to write books about barbecue. Absolutely. Um, he and Amy, and Amy Mills as well, taught me a lot and kind of geared me off into this whole other world, world of barbecue, not just competition barbecue, that I delved into and learned about and wrote some books about. A couple wrote of some names great that, books. that jumped to mind, but there's been, yeah. been tons, tons of people that have been super influential to me. Yeah, I mean, the, the cookbooks are amazing. I can't tell you how many of the recipes I've cooked out of there uh, when I need something new and different. And it's just a great read. It really is a good time. Right on. Right on. <laughs> Glad you're enjoying them. It's fun to write. <laughs> when you hear the word successful in terms of barbecue, who's the first person that comes to mind? I hope you don't have this one from some of your other. I'd probably say Aaron, Aaron Franklin. I, I, think, I think the reason Aaron Franklin comes to mind is, I mean, obviously he's wildly he has a wildly successful restaurant, but it's also a little bit that kind of next, he was, he kind of brought on this, I think this next generation of barbecue that we see today. Uh, he fully embraced the history, but he also kind of 
made it his own and did something a little bit different kind of created yeah. a whole new a whole new type of barbecue restaurant almost and and there's all sorts of great restaurants that are following in that following that example and uh he kind of he kind of sort of he's a trailblazer on that front he's super talented incredible barbecue cook he, he's probably come to, the first guy that comes to mind for me he's an incredible guy too he's super nice we'll talk to anybody spend time with anybody he's just a great guy yeah yeah i like aaron a lot although i he did send me home on a barbecue cooking show one time which i thought was completely unfair but other than that, <laughs> <laughs> it was slightly unfair yeah. we'll give you that <laughs> you mentioned earlier that you know, you you get a lot of gut feelings when you're cooking. Yeah. How do you relate to those when they happen? How do you wrestle with it? Yeah, I, I mean, I, th- I think it's a little bit of what I touched on earlier with, you know, the judges aren't in your tents. When you have a category that goes sideways, if, if you're not conscious of it, you can, it can, it can kind of infiltrate the rest of your cook. You know, like, right. like you got chicken in by like two seconds before the window closed. You drop the rack of ribs, whatever it is that went sideways. And then, okay, you recovered for it. You got the dish and you got a choice. You got a choice to make. You let that kind of negative experience kind of, kind of permeate the rest of your cook or do you not? And you, you need to be kind of conscious of that. I think uh, that's probably the, the, the number one thing, but you know, just uh, for me, that's what cooking from the gut is just something that works. It's the way I like to cook. It's, it's fun that way. I don't, you, you can, do I wrap at seven every morning? Not necessarily. It really just depends, you know, little, it letting it, I think it's great to let a little bit of that come in and that, that, that kind of place to cook on your own food. I think a little bit too, it's in that same kind of vein of it's, it's also in the same kind of vein of being a great pit master before, compared to a good pit master is getting that feel for, for what's right. And as opposed to just following the Excel spreadsheet, we wrap at seven. So we're going to wrap at seven. It's somewhat limiting. And you can get a little cocky too. You know, sometimes that cooking with feel is kind of like, you know, you get a little bit, you know, kind of swing in and get, and then it can, you can come or in particular doing something very different on, on the contest morning, you know, and it, that you've never done before that, it, you know, there's a difference between cooking from the gut and just like slinging out something brand new that you've never tried before, which I've done many times and it's fun. But you, you probably, you know, you might want to, you know, you got a thousand dollars riding right on shit and you might want to try practicing it first, but it does keep it fun. Right. I, I only pull that shit when my wife isn't in the trailer. I can't. <laughs> like, yeah, we'll try this new finish today. And oh, it did well. Yeah. I tried that new finish. And if I didn't work, then say la vie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> What's before we get into my favorite questions, which are the rapid fire ones at the end? What's been the most surprising thing to come out of barbecue for you? Writing books, yeah, not something, not something I thought was going to happen. Cooking, you know, when I first started cooking on a WSM uh, in an Easy Up uh, single Easy Up uh, twenty years ago, especially about competition. But you know, like my my books have been Wicked Good Barbecue is largely a competition barbecue book. Pitmaster has a chapter on it. And I never, I never would have thought that get an opportunity to um, write books about it. And it's been, that's been a pretty cool thing to do. Yeah. It's definitely you, surprising. And definitely surrounding, your, surrounding yourself with some of your, your guys that are fantastic, both in the book world and in the cooking world. You know, Andy, he's an amazing guy, an amazing chef. They're just, it's, they're great people to be around and you can learn so much from that. You know, those books have really brought about a lot of change in backyard cooking. And, and I think it's done a great job for getting people outside and cooking, which I think is the goal for all of us, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Andy and I um, go back uh, to high school. We, we met, Andy and I met in high school. We were in the H homeroom, Hart and Husbands in the H homeroom <laughs> at Needham High School. We always, you know, we threw parties. We were we were uh, pretty socially oriented, less academically oriented, <laughs> and and through parties, hung out all through college. Opened a restaurant together. Andy and I opened a restaurant, Tremont Six Four Seven in Boston, in the uh, late '90s together, and it didn't really work out. 
right? It, it, I mean, the restaurant worked out. It, it went on and had a long story career. I left the restaurant after a few years. The restaurant life wasn't for me. You know, I had a young family. I was working crazy hours. And uh, I, left the, uh, I left the restaurant business and went into software, which is a little bit more sane <laughs> uh, way to, to earn a living and pay the mortgage. But I missed, I missed food. And Andy and I, you know, kind of had a rough patch for the first time in our lives at that point when I left the restaurant. And the way that we got back together is we went and cooked a barbecue contest in whatever, like the fall of 98 or something like that. And that was like the first real barbecue contest that I had ever cooked. And that was the way that we kind of reforged our friendship after having a tough time opening a restaurant and kind of over the years recruited various people. My brother came on board, who's... um, kind of the, as I mentioned before, the, the manager, the kind of task manager, to make sure we get the, 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 the meats turned into the right order. John Delpha, great chefs on the team. And then Ken Goodman joined the team. Ken, an old, yeah. old friend of, of Andy's. And yeah, I mean, just at a, Andy has gone on to open a, a chain of uh, successful barbecue restaurants called the smoke shop. And uh, Ken has moved on to become a, uh, like a renowned, incredible food photographer and has shot, he had, he has, he has shot like 50 cookbooks, different cookbooks, and uh, he's he's pretty amazing too. So it's been really cool to uh, see see a variety of people on our team succeed in barbecue in different ways. Absolutely. And Ken, we were a part of one of the cookbooks that he shot. It was a collection of recipes, and he came down and, and shot our food one day. And I just remember having the best time with him. He's just such a great guy. <laughs> he's a really good guy. What he's what he's really good at is finding what's great about you. Like he really sees the best in people and that that's comes through in his photography. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Jamie's one of my favorite people in barbecue. We don't see each other often, but every time we do, we love having a couple of beers together. He's just a funny guy. <laughs> I love Jamie. With Jamie's background, that's been really helpful for the team is that he, um, he used to be on the, the MIT blackjack team which wow. basically uh, counts cards, you know, goes to casinos and counts cards. And they have this whole very complicated mathematical system to uh, get a, get a leg up on the, on the house. <laughs> and so that's one of his backgrounds. And he kind of brings that analytical thinking to the team, does some stuff on like post, you know, uh, scoring analysis, like aggregating score. I don't know. Do you do this? Aggregating scoring over a long period of time and trying to find trends, stuff like that is always interesting to do. Interesting. No, I've not. My wife will tear apart a score sheet after a contest for a good hour and a half in the car. So I'm generally done with it after that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we got two eights in, in rib tenderness. So what are you going to do to fix that? And I'm like, what were the other four? <laughs> you know, <laughs> they yeah. were nines. So, you know. Plus you can get really lousy. You know, the judging is, it's too small. One judge sheet is too small of a sample size to do anything. Like you, you should not, yeah. probably not make any significant changes based on one contest and one set of scores. But you could take a whole season's worth and put them in an Excel spreadsheet. And maybe you'd find, you know, we got a real problem with tenderness on pork. Or if you just get one thing that might be something to think about well you you found me out i do do it every five contests okay if, there, if there's a meat that's trending in one either taste appearance or tenderness if it's trending one way i will try and isolate that problem there you go but i have to and i do it does change every contest because it's five different contests so yeah yeah you got me <laughs> that's why i came on the show i'm trying to get us i'm trying to call a couple secrets out of you <laughs> you know you're i'm an open book to you my friend <laughs> well, let's get into these rapid fire questions because i think these are a lot of fun what do you see about barbecue on social media that upsets or bothers you well i can i can one thing that i always get a laugh I, I i laugh about i'm sorry i know i've written it i know everybody that's that's might be listening to this probably has said this but I laugh about it, and, and sometimes, I don't know if it, it doesn't necessarily bother me, is the comments, we had a really good cook, but the judges didn't agree. <laughs> so I don't know. It's like, well, you, if it, the, only, the whole point of going there is getting, you know, is winning the contest, and if the judges didn't agree, it doesn't really matter whether you thought you had a good cook or not. It goes uh, back to your statement of, you know, they have no idea how it got there. 
<laughs> you know? Yeah. That, yeah. And now I won't. Yeah, that's funny. I never thought about that one before. I just want to when I when I see that, and you just see it a lot. In any case, the judging can be, judging can be tough. It's it's frustrating yeah, yeah. when you uh, when you uh, put the level of effort in and the money in and and cook good food and and the judging's uh, off. Absolutely. Do you have a favorite pre, during, or post competition meal? Yeah, pre is probably like a uh, a kind of a meat and free thing. Like so, like soul foodie kind of like fried chicken, mashed potato kind of kind of set up. But they like up up on the hill, a jack when they do their pre dinner before that contest, they do a meal kind of like that. Oh, Miss Mary, like Miss Mary Bobo's, like Miss Mary yeah. Bobo's food is my favorite for uh, pre pre contest food. During probably like uh, biscuit and uh, gravy in the morning. Somebody usually has that going on. After is probably either sushi or salad bar. Like a nice like iceberg lettuce vegetables vegetables uh, would be proposed absolutely As we get we generally get sushi every night after a contest that's our thing what is your favorite present that you like to give to people beer one of my <laughs> one of my other hobbies is is beer we got some amazing breweries up in uh, new england up in vermont in particular absolutely yeah. Um, and uh, I like giving people beer. Like I, kind of, I have a behind me here in the, the closet right back here. I don't know if you can see it in the in the uh, in the shot, but uh, got a beer cellar full of uh, well aged beers, and it's probably one thing I like to give the most. Does beer age? Certain like wine? beers do. Yeah. Certain beers, certain beers do age like wine. Yeah. Typically, either uh, like a uh, beer that's a, a sour, like Belgian saisons kind of beers, age very well. As do like uh, imperial stouts, high alcohol imperial stouts, maybe that have been aged in a bourbon barrel or something like that. Those age really well too. Huh. I did not know that. I'm a huge saison yeah. fan. That is, uh, if I had to have a passion in beer, it is the saison or farmhouse ale. Uh, well, I got a I got a bottle of beer that I'm going to give to you next time I see you. I got the perfect bottle for you. Sweet, sweet. That's a, I hate IPAs. I just have never gotten into them. It's just too much for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I got some good saisons for you. Cool. All right. If you could have a giant billboard anywhere with anything on it, getting a message out to millions or billions, what would it say and why? I don't know. I I, I kind of uh, my kids get stressed out a lot you know about school or whatever look look to me for advice and i always my my thing for them is you know focus on today try to get you know don't think about your test three weeks from now what, what do you need to do today so it's something along that like like do today well right is just think is just yeah. trying to execute on what you want to do today i think if we focus you know that works for me when i i ran the boston marathon a couple of years in 2019 that barbecue guy and i ran the boston marathon I, I ran run is a kind term maybe slowly jogged occasionally walked might be more accurate but that's how i and and then when you look at the uh the training schedule on doing on something like the marathon or something like qualifying for the jack daniels big task gotta do a lot to pull that off running the marathon whatever it is you know, you went, when I went to run the marathon, I, I looked out at the training schedule and I was like, you're going to run 14 miles on this day way out here. It's like, <laughs> I can't run 14. You're crazy. But, you know, today's goal was to run three and walk two. All right, let's do that. Let's worry about that. Move on to the next day. So that's my, that's my uh, sage advice. Do today well. Do today well. I love it. It was so fun watching your journey through your training. And you did a really good job of cataloging that on social media and it was uh i remember looking at kim going man chris is going to run the boston marathon <laughs> like, <laughs> the i don't want to i don't want to drive 26 miles in boston let alone run them it was an interesting experience <laughs> yeah yeah well man i want to thank you so much for being on here today where can people find you online uh we mentioned the cookbooks already there's the uh the Wicked Good Barbecue Cookbook and Pitmaster. Uh, where can people find you? Probably the best place to get me is Instagram. That's where I, I hang out the most is on Instagram, at Chris Hart, two A's in heart, H-A-A-R-T, Chris Hart on Instagram. That's where I'm hanging out these days. So uh, give me a follow. Very cool. I'll be back. And yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, 
I want to thank you again for not only being on the podcast, but being such an influence on us and a lot of other people in barbecue. One of my favorite pictures that I've ever taken was one that uh, we had taken at Harpoon with me, you, and Bill Gillespie. Oh, yeah, that's a good one, man. It was a, it was a great a shot. One. Bill and I still, we sit down and talk about it and have beers, and we're like, man, so much. I still do so much of that. So. <laughs> yeah, right yeah. on, right on. So Happy to hear that. Very... It means a lot to me. Yeah, it's very cool to have you on here. So thank you very much. Thanks, Luke. Take care. Thank you for listening to Pitmaster, an Old Virginia Smoke podcast. Be sure to subscribe and like the podcast, rate the podcast, and share it out with all your friends. Also, be sure to check out the Old Virginia Smoke YouTube channel as well. We will have another episode for you next week. For companies interested in advertising, please contact Old Virginia Smoke directly via www.oldvirginiasmoke.com. Pitmaster, an Old Virginia Smoke podcast, is edited by Chris Sedenka. Pitmaster, an Old Virginia Smoke podcast, is a property of Old Virginia Smoke, LLC. All rights reserved. Copyright 2021. Old Virginia Smoke.